Good evening. I'm Linda Lara, and I'd like to welcome you to the Aspen Institute series, Conversations with Great Leaders in Memory of Preston Robert Tisch. For those joining us for the first time, I'd like to welcome you to Roosevelt House, the Public Policy Institute of Hunter College, and the historic home of Sarah Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt House is the Institute's kind of home away from home. It's where we have most of our programming during the year in New York City, thanks to a wonderful partnership with Jennifer Rabb, president of Hunter College. The Conversations with the Great Leaders series actually began in 2009, thanks to a generous grant from Lori Tisch and her brothers, and over the years has featured leaders who are making a difference in their communities by the way they look at their commitment to building and maintaining a civil society, one that ensures fair and equitable treatment for all individuals. These leaders that you see in this series represent the values and commitments to public service and public good that reflect the works of the man honored by the series, Bob Tisch. Tonight's topic, the current rise in book bans affecting schools and libraries across the country should be of great interest to anyone who believes that the freedom to read is a crucial element of civil society and indeed of any democratic society. As you probably know, book banning has been around for quite a while, centuries even. The earliest record of a banned book in the US dates to 1637 and involves a businessman in Quincy, Massachusetts, who wrote a book critical of the Puritan establishment. I'm guessing that comparing them to crustaceans didn't help his book sales. <laughs> Most of us will be familiar with the authors whose books have been banned over the years. In fact, if you go to Barnes & Noble on Fifth Avenue, there's a table announcing banned books. Um, the table is devoted to authors such as Toni Morrison, Margaret Atwood, J.D. Salinger, Maya Angelou, and Harper Lee. But as you'll hear tonight, the growth and extent of books banned from schools and libraries across the country has dramatically increased over the past few years and is overwhelmingly directed at young readers. However, tonight you'll also hear about what's being done to combat book banning, in particular, a project created by one amazing group of librarians from the Brooklyn Public Library to ensure that young people have the freedom to read. For that project, they were named 2023 Librarians of the Year by Library Journal, and Fast Company named BPL a winner of their 2023 World Changing Ideas Award in the social justice category. <laughs> Tonight's speaker, Linda Johnson, is the president and CEO of Brooklyn Public Library, which launched Books Unbanned to give young people across the country who are affected by the book bans free access to BPL's digital collection and learning databases. The 61 branch public library system is the fifth largest library system in the country and the ninth largest cultural institution in New York. Linda has overseen its transformation from an analog to a modern library with state-of-the-art technology available free to all patrons. Combating censorship is one of the most important issues she has grappled with during her tenure. Protecting our democracy's freedoms has also informed the career of tonight's moderator, Suzanne Nossel, the chief executive officer at PEN America and author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. PEN America is a nonprofit organization that works to defend and celebrate free expression in the US and worldwide through the advancement of literature and human rights. Prior to joining PEN America, 
Suzanne served as Chief Operating Officer of Human Rights Watch and as Executive Director of Amnesty International USA, and they also held positions in both the Obama and Clinton administrations. And now before turning the program over to Suzanne, I'd like to remind you to turn your cell phones off or put them on mute. Suzanne, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Linda. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, it's great. Okay, well, it's lovely to be here and uh, I appreciate all of you coming out this evening uh, to hear from Linda and us about book banning. So Linda, let's start, it, tell us as the CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, when did this issue kind of come onto your radar screen? Is it something that you've dealt with all along in your tenure? And, and what changed and when? And, and how did you observe that? Um, thanks, Suzanne. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Before I jump right in, I just want to say how humbled I am to be in this seat for this particular series. Unfortunately, I never knew Bob Tisch, although because of my friendship with Lori and the family, I feel like I did. And so I'm um, beyond flattered um, and happy that some of my partners in all of this are here um, this evening as well. Um, yeah, book banning is not a new thing, certainly. And we, though, in New York are pretty fortunate that it's something that tends to occur when people have problems with a book because perhaps under today's, um, in, under, you know, to, in today's world, the book seems somehow dated and perhaps prejudiced. So in Brooklyn, if somebody challenged a book, you know, as recently as last year, um, it was typically because um, there was an, Ill I'll use the Dr. Seuss example, it's the best example of it. Um, you look at an illustration, it's an illustration that many of us saw routinely as we were growing up, but in today's world, um, it reeks of prejudice, and so what do you do about that book that's in your collection? And our solution is always to try and find in favor of the book and to move it out of, for example, the children's collection and into perhaps a history collection so that it can stay in the library but in a different context. Um, of course, that's not what's happening around the country. And the increase in uh, the bans that in the censor, real censorship that's been going on, um, I and my colleagues um, at the library, I guess about I don't know, almost two years ago now, we're really alarmed at what we were seeing. And I think it reached a pitch with us when it was so prevalent in Texas. And the reason we were so concerned was because that's where many, most actually textbooks are published. And so we said like, wow, like this is serious. And we started to reach out to people in Texas that we thought maybe would want to partner on something like this. And I remember telling a friend about that idea and he laughed like, <laughs> like somebody's gonna, in Texas is gonna wanna join this effort, like the big city slickers are gonna come in and take care of what's happening uh, in Texas. And it turned out he was absolutely right. So um, one day uh, we were talking about the fact that we were not getting any traction and that we might need to go at it alone. And um, Nick Higgins, who's here tonight, who's the chief librarian at Brooklyn Public Library, um, he said, well, let's just do it. Let's just go for it. And I was like, I am completely game. And at the moment... Can you um, explain the it? It, to yes. Well, it. what we ultimately landed on was a program that gave access to anybody from the ages of 13 to 21 to the digital collection of Brooklyn Public Library. And the thought was that if teens across the country weren't able to read material that they were searching for, in many cases to read stories that help them develop their own perspectives and their own worldview, that their worlds were, being, were shrinking. Um, and so we said, if you're these ages, you need to write us an email and we will send you a QR code. <clears throat> and then we said, well, this is interesting, but we're serving people outside of New York City, which is really not our mission. And so we developed a whole program for teens in Brooklyn to help teens around the country. And so we have a Freedom Council that develops um, book lists and holds um, 
uh, book club meetings. And so there's a component that also is doing some good work right here at home. And I will also mention, just because I'm sensitive to this, that all this work that we're doing around the country is not being done with city money or even state money, that it's money that we've raised privately. Great. So it's wonderful. I mean, what do you say, Linda, because we get this argument, we do a lot of work on the book ban issue at PEN America, and some people make the argument, well, look, if the books are available via QR code, or if the books are available on Amazon, uh, or if the books are available you know, in a library but not in a school or in a bookstore, that's not a ban. What do you say to that? If, even if the book has been uh, withheld, let's say, uh, in a classroom, how do you answer that? Oh, we see that as a ban. I mean, especially, you know, if, um, and this has happened in school libraries and classrooms in many of these states, um, if teachers aren't allowed to teach curriculum, because it gets beyond the book alone, if it starts to affect the curricula, um, it has a deep impact on what students are learning and what teachers can teach. And the nice thing about our partnership is while the library is protecting uh, readers, PEN America, in addition to studying um, the prevalence of all of this, is also obviously deeply committed to protecting writers. And so um, the, the efforts uh, or the idea that somehow enterprising teenagers are gonna get their hands on these books anyway, and, that's certainly the case in many um, situations. It's certainly not universal, and it doesn't actually get to the heart of the problem. Can you talk about what, you know, the books that are targeted overwhelmingly, as Linda touched on, are books by and about authors and characters of color and LGBTQ narratives. And I've learned a lot about what some of these books mean for certain categories of students. And I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, what, what you've seen and observed about just how important these books are and why in may, ways that may not be self-evident to all of us. So we said, if you're the you know, within this range of ages and you want this material, send us an email. And we thought we would get sort of, you know, emails that said, I want the QR code. Instead, we got very thoughtful, poignant messages from teenagers around the country, in fact, from all 50 states. Um, we've issued over 6,200 cards at this point and circulated over 100,000 uh, books and material. Um, but they went paragraph by paragraph about what it meant not to be able to read the books that they were looking for and uh, how it made them feel, um, the isolation that um, being told that a story about somebody who shared some of the experiences you were looking to read about made you feel less uh, good about yourself, um, prevented you from sort of forming your own opinion. We got emails about um, how the card, we, we got emails asking for the card and then we've received messages from parents sometimes as well about just what it's meant to their families to be able to access these collections. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we planned this a little more as a conversation, so maybe yeah. we'll, we'll shift uh, into that a bit more. I mean, one of the things for me that has been so striking is particularly for LGBTQ teenagers growing up in communities where they're not accepted by their parents. They're not accepted by their school. They may be very isolated, very fearful, very stigmatized. A book can be a lifeline. I mean, it can be you know, that which helps them to see that there could be a future for them, that there are other people out there somewhere like them, uh, that you know, what they're experiencing is not uh, just an anomaly or something that they ought to suppress. And I've, I've heard librarians say, these books are truly life-saving, and I, 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 I certainly it. feel that way, and I know my team does as well. And I will tell you a story, not to sort of sound melodramatic here, but a lot of this began here in New York State when the um, state librarian posted something on Twitter about a book called Gender Queer, and said that the book had been extremely helpful to her child. Um, and that like created a tempest and 
she immediately took the, um, the post down. But we all think we have the luxury of living where we do and perhaps like saying that this doesn't affect us and we don't need to be mindful of it. That's not true. It's close. <laughs> and I don't, I, again, I don't want to sound alarmist, but there are pockets of this everywhere. And none of us have the luxury of, of sort of saying it doesn't apply to me and I don't, I don't have to do anything about it. I mean, one of the tough issues that we reckon with is a book like Genderqueer is a good example because it is a lifesaver for certain readers, absolutely, but it's also a very explicit book. I mean, if you took a look at it, I remember when I, when it first came up, my colleague was like, you have, you have to, to look read at this. this. Like, he's like, you, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. before you talk about this, you really yeah. have to see what's yeah. in here. Uh, you know, it's illustrated and it's pretty graphic. And It is, in fact, a graphic novel. Yes. So, so the dilemma then arises, well, okay, this is an essential book for some readers, but, you know, is it appropriate for all readers? And at what age? And, I, and the authors of these books, you know, will say... Uh, that they don't, they didn't intend this book to be for the very, you know, for the youngest readers or even for elementary school age. They intended it to be for, uh, you know, perhaps middle grades or, or teenagers. And so, in some of these instances, you know, the, the argument that gets made is that, you know, that that's simply now being sort of enforced or policed, and that that the the, the what we might characterize as a ban is really just a matter of ensuring kind of age appropriateness. How do you think about that? And how do you deal with it at the library? I mean, what happens when a kid, you know, if a, if a kid who's seven or eight years old happened upon that book at a Brooklyn Public Library branch and wanted to check it out, what would happen? Well, a seven or eight-year-old would not be able to because there are different levels of access depending on age. Um, but, but the issue is really, what is the role of a parent in a child's reading? Um, and at the library, we are very much about encouraging parents to be deeply involved in what their children are reading from the time they're born. And even in our you know, zero to five-year-old programming, obviously, those kids aren't reading. We're all about making sure that parents and caregivers understand the importance of reading to their children. So um, I, it gets back to the question of being involved and we hope parents are and hope that they are talking about these issues with their children, but we know that's not always the case. We also know, as you pointed out earlier, that enterprising teenagers can put their hands on this material, but that's not uh, you know, a, a good enough answer. You know, it really has to be that at some point, um, teenagers have agency uh, over their own reading lists. Yeah, and I think one of the most important things, and one of the charges that gets made increasingly around the country is characterizing these books as pornographic mm. uh, or obscene. And you know, we've heard that time and again, not just about something like gender care, no, no, about Jody. It Pico's becomes it becomes an it becomes an excuse. Like the book Mouse, which is another graphic novel about the Holocaust, has been deemed pornographic because there is in pages and pages of illustrations one picture where there's a person getting out of a bathtub nude. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, there are all these excuses that are put out there to ban books that are sending a message that certain people just don't want. Uh, right, and we have an established legal definition of obscenity that's very well uh, established by our courts. And these books, you know, by no means uh, meet it. You know, it's a, something that appeals to the prurient interest, that has no li li redeeming literary value. Uh, so it has nothing to do with these books, and that has become kind of a, a very distorted justification for these bans, and, a, a, you know, something that we're, in, and at PEN America, we're suing now in Escambia County in Florida, along with a group of authors and a group of parents and Penguin Random House, uh, charging that the banning of these books violates both the First Amendment, uh, because it's a freedom of speech issue when you're picking and choosing books and plucking them off the shelf based on what's inside them, what the viewpoints are, what, this, what stories are being told. We're also bringing a 14th Amendment claim, which is on the basis that the, these bans are discriminatory, that they disproportionately target 
authors uh, and readers of color and LGBTQ individuals, and that, that denies uh, children their right to an equal education and authors their right to reach an audience on equal terms. Yeah, well, we've been cheering you on in that lawsuit. Right, I know yeah. you might. Right, that <laughs> yeah. may, not, may not be the role of uh, the Brooklyn Public Library right. to sue uh, <laughs> sue down in No, Florida. but I have to say I am overwhelmed because when I I've been in this room a million times, but when I sat here with this perspective uh, on the four freedom speech and the first, you know, obvious two freedoms are, are uh, exactly what we're talking about here tonight. I have to say, it's <laughs> powerful. Yeah, I mean, I'll say something else, which is the fourth freedom, the freedom from fear. Yeah. You know, this is really about intimidation, intimidation of teachers and librarians passing laws, for example, in Florida, uh, banning discussions of LGBTQ identity in schools. What that does is sort of send a message that all kinds of books might be off limits because perhaps it's going to provoke a child, uh, lead a child to ask a question that you as a teacher can't answer that could take the classroom discussion into dangerous territory. And you know that's how censorship works. It's not just the books that come directly into the crosshairs. It casts a wider chill. And we're seeing laws being passed across the country that target uh, speech about LGBTQ identities, that target speech about race uh, and our, the history of racial discrimination and racial justice and slavery in this country uh, that target discussions that might make people feel guilty on account of their race. And if you know that that could get you into trouble and you're a teacher or a principal or a librarian, you know, you've got to think very carefully about what comes onto your syllabus, about what the readings are, about what questions the kids might ask, what they might tell their parents about what's going on in school. And it's a, a climate of intimidation that, you know, to me is just the exact opposite of what we ought to be fostering for our kids. Well, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, um, when this program began, um, and we have Summer Bramier here with us tonight, who was a teacher in Oklahoma, who was told what, what could and couldn't be taught in her 10th grade English class. And uh, she put a shroud around the bookshelf in her classroom and said, I'm, I would have liked to teach uh, the books that are on these shelves, um, but I'm not permitted to do that this semester. Um, but there's, here's the QR code, and if you're interested in these books, check it out, Brooklyn Public Library is offering them. Now, she is very brave. Um, and uh, and also articulate and was one of you know voted like teacher of the years and had actually gone to the high school where she was presently teaching and uh, she decided that this was um, a hill worth dying on and we are now fortunate to have her on our books on band team but it's because uh, the powers that be in Norman Oklahoma which is a university town uh, have decided that even though she left um, to work with us, that they should continue the efforts to revoke her teaching certification, which is, you know, I can't think of a better word than disgusting. Um, and <laughs> uh, and so that 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 is an example of what's happening. And the problem is, if you are a teacher in a school that's dealing with legislation that's circumventing the First Amendment, or if you're in a librarian, if you're in a library and worried about um, your funding because you're flaunting a law that's been enacted, you are really stuck between the proverbial, you know, rock and a hard place. Linda, how do you, for yourself, explain this? Like, what is going on? How do you make sense? You know, I feel, I've said uh, many times now, I feel like I, I hardly recognize my own country because of this. I mean, this is something I never yeah. thought. You and I have I had these witness. conversations, yeah. and I try out different ideas on Suzanne because she's smart about these things. Um, you know, I, I want to believe that some of it is inattention, that um, there's a small but vocal and powerful group that's patient and been working on this issue for years, not unlike uh, what's happened in the judiciary uh, around the country, um, and that it's all sort of building steam and it's coming to a head right now. Um, but it's more than that. And, and I will say, the Books on Band program, which was initially designed to put material in the hands of kids who couldn't find it, um, it's turned into something much more than that, which is also 
to shine a light on the issue to make sure that people are aware of what's going on and, uh, and to get involved if they care about it. But um, yeah, I don't know what's happening in this country. It's, it's demoralizing. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, I think it's um, it's partly what you say, which is a, a long-standing movement that uh, years ago, you know, they they sort of invoked the mantle of parents' rights, and that seems like a very mothers for liberty, term. mothers for mothers, liberty, moms for liberty. Uh, and if you look at the history of the parents' rights movement, years ago they were suing to try to get more religion into schools uh, and to uh, restrict certain readings in public schools, and that those efforts were, for the most part, defeated. And then they turned toward homeschooling, and it was a whole homeschooling movement that uh, was aimed at giving parents more leeway and freedom to take control of their kids' education with less interference from the state. Uh, and then I think they saw an opening to go back into public schools. I think part of it was the effort to sort of uh, decline, reduce the funding for public schools, to, in some communities, uh, pull resources away from public schools, either to channel them to private academies and uh, loosen the restrictions on the separation of church and state. Uh, in some cases, the rise of charter schools outside of public educational systems, and an opportunity to really uh, sort of encroach on and uh, make life difficult in public schools. And I think some, you know, for some, the motivation may be ultimately one day to get rid of public schools entirely in some of these communities. And I think that has met up with a much more sort of uh, recent uh, newfangled uh, anti-woke movement that comes from uh, a sense that some of the racial reckoning in the wake of the death of George Floyd and some of the societal transition that we've been undergoing on LGBTQ issues has kind of gone too far, too fast, and it's uh, too doctrinaire, and that uh, traditional values are being overridden, or that certain expectations uh, and ways of doing things that people are accustomed to are coming under pressure, and that, you know, I think this is where Governor DeSantis comes in, that, you know, we need to push back. He's, he's by uh, activating his followers to push back, and they've decided that schools and books and education are a prime kind of battleground. I mean, I, I, I think of it, you know, they used to talk about a pocketbook issue, you know, somebody think that would if affect you, uh, it, it, you know, it right in your wallet uh, and with your home budget. This is a backpack issue. It's, it affects what comes home. It affects your children. It affects something that you care about deeply that's very personal. And I think uh, some politicians have seized on it as a way to rally people, to rile up their anger, to energize them, uh, and to uh, advance their own yeah. political objectives. So I, I initially thought, and part of this was timing, that this was part in part happening at such an accelerated pace because of the election cycle and that when the elections were over then it was going to kind of you know wane uh, and that didn't happen <laughs> yeah that I clearly was wrong about that and um, the other thing i would say is you know I, I mentioned earlier these emails that we've gotten from students who have requested um, the qr code and there are many from people who are being homeschooled in conservative communities uh, and you know smart kids who are aware that there's stuff that they're not being exposed to and that they would really like to learn. You know, this goes to the heart of what a public library is, right? We talk about libraries as being the town square uh, in every community where there's a library, a place where people can come together to talk about the dilemmas of the day. Um, and if people can't learn uh, about these things and talk to their neighbors and their colleagues and their friends about what's happening, um, then it starts to affect civic life and sort of how we define who we are and how we live, which, you know, is frightening. Yeah, no, I agree. I think of it as, you know, there's a lot of pressure right now on our democracy, whether it's polarization or gerrymandering or restrictions on voting rights. But to me, this is an, an issue of democracy. It's how we raise an informed, engaged citizenry, how we prepare kids to deal with a diversity of ideas, uh, to deal with ideas that may be threatening or that they may disagree with, uh, and how to confront that and engage with others. You know, the public school is where that ought to happen. And if we're sending the message that 
You know, the teachers are uh, living in fear uh, that books are dangerous, that, uh, you know, these books are so dangerous that we're going to withhold them from you. Uh, that is, you know, to me, but, doing the very yeah, opposite. But, but if you look at what's being banned, um, they're... The, just coincidentally, the library just celebrated its 125th anniversary, and we milked it for a, a good long year. Um, but in the last week, um, we published the 125 most circulated books in our 125th, um, 25 years of existence. And on, the, on that list of 125 uh, books were at least 15 that had become the target, you know, frequent targets of, um, of censorship, which is just a, a sort of a way to confirm that these are some of the books that are being challenged are books that have been in the American canon for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have books by Toni Morrison, books by yeah. Judy Blume, uh, yeah. you know, 1984, beloved. books that we all, that we all sort of learned uh, from in school. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really something. It's really something. What do you see that gives you hope and a sense of uh, optimism in terms of how this is going to net out and, and where we'll be, say, another year or two from now? Um, I, I do think um, that, you know, over the last year that we've been at this, um, that it's become much more front and center, especially recently. Um, there are um, many more people talking about the issue and coming out, even the president, um, you know, has spoken about it. Um, and there are teachers like Summer who, you know, are fighting back. Um, and I, I think our job really is to con just continue to amplify the message and make sure that people who care are, are fighting it because, and again, maybe this is naivete, but I really don't believe, or I don't want to believe that we live in a country where the majority of our, um, of our citizens think censorship is a good thing. Yeah, and the statistics overwhelmingly are very clear on this, that regardless of party, Americans don't like book bans. And I think that's one of the reasons why Governor DeSantis actually denies that he is banning books. He says the, you know, the claims of book banning are a hoax. He said that uh, more than once, uh, including last week when he announced his presidential bid, and I find that somewhat heartening in that he doesn't want to see seem like a book batter. He wants to style himself as someone who's protecting your children from these perilous ideas or these corrupting influences. Uh, but, you know, when you point out that the, me, the way he's doing that is by banning books, he recognizes that that uh, is not necessarily a winning proposition politically. So I do think, as you say, it's extremely important to call this out for what it is. I mean, one of the issues we deal with at Penn, because we do a lot of the documentation and counting of book bans, so we've documented more than 1,500 book bans this year, more than 4,000 uh, over since July of 2021. And some of the bans are temporary. So it's, uh, you know, right now in Florida, a single individual uh, any one of you, whether you have a child in the school or not, can come forward and fill out a, a, a one-page form, scrawl in something, hand it in, and get a book pulled from the shelf for a review. We had an incident last week with Amanda Gorman, you know, the inaugural poet. Yeah, yeah you all saw this. Uh, and that form, if you if you had a chance to read it, first of all, it said Oprah Winfrey was the author of Amanda's book, for starters. <laughs> and it said something like, you know, could indirectly promote hate. It was the most, that was the charge against the book. And there's a question, have you read any reviews of this book? No, I haven't. Uh, you know, have you looked at what other people have said about this book? No, I haven't. So it was the most cursory imaginable objection, and that was enough to get the book removed from an elementary school section of a library uh, in, in Miami-Dade. And that's happening, there are only just 11 people are responsible for uh, the removal of more than yeah. 500 books in the state of Florida. Yeah, but so this, this is the central issue, which is that, you know, an individual person may want to decide what his or her child should be reading, but it is not okay 
for that person to be deciding what everyone else's kids are reading. And this is really what's at the core of this. Right, it's an inversion of parents' rights. It's one parent, or not even a parent, asserting their right, uh, right to dictate for sometimes thousands or even tens of thousands, the 37,000 students in Escambia County, uh, and, and more than 100 book bans have been initiated by a single teacher in that county. A teacher, that's heartening. <laughs> so I think we're going to open it up uh, and uh, uh, get, uh, get your, some of your questions in. Uh, and I know there are mics that are going to move around the room. And if, if we can, we'll start here in the first row. Uh, but I think you need to wait for the mics. I'll just ask you to wait for one minute. <laughs> no, it, it's needed for the recording. Thank you. Thank you both. This has been really a, a dream conversation and what we dreamed of when we started the series. So thank you both so much. You're not banned from coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. You can pick and choose or answer both. One is, are there any books at all that maybe should be banned, either all the way from the left, all the way from the right? Um, so think about that. And then also, are you getting push? Uh, what's your relationship with the, um, with the religious schools, with the ultra-Orthodox schools, with the Catholic schools, and do you, do you deal with them at all, or it's really just the public schools? Um, I just um, lost the question for a minute. The, the first the, one was about whether, whether, any, about book whether any book should be banned. Um, and I, I think um, in some ways, you know, whatever that sort of cliche is about politics, making strange um, bedfellows, um, our feeling at the library is um, one of the things that's the core of librarianship is the, you know, the fact that we feel that we should be protecting books that we disagree with as fervently as those that we do not agree with. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about, about the, sec the yeah. second one. And, you know, I think, I mean, I agree. I think even things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion or something that, you know, is a a hateful screed, uh, or, uh, you know, there, it always comes up, uh, the Disney, like the Song of the South, which is a very kind of racist film, but whether that, you know, and that's a film that's more or less been withdrawn from circulation. I think they should be available somewhere. You know, there may be scholars who are interested. Uh, I mean, you know, that's to the to point that I was talking research. about earlier. You, you've got to move it to the right place in the library, right. but. It doesn't need to be on the table in the front of the library. And, you know, and that sends an important message, but it should be, uh, accessible uh, in some way. You know, we deal somewhat with religious schools, although the, you know, a, a lot of the time at PEN America as a free expression organization, we're defending the First Amendment. And so that applies in public schools and not in private schools. So if a private school wants to, you know, it's a Christian school and they have a Christian library, they're within their rights. That's freedom of association, that's freedom of religion. Uh, but in many cases, they've sort of made some type of public commitment. They, like, we deal a lot with private universities, and they've committed themselves to the ideals of academic freedom and freedom of expression. So when they violate those ideals, we will call them out. But, uh, it, you know, it depends whether they've, what they've committed themselves to. And the environment in some of those schools, you know, there's a big debate. I mean, it's not a book issue, but a uh, big debate at Yeshiva University right now about accrediting uh, an LGBTQ student organization and, you know, they basically were ready to shut down all of their student organizations rather than accredit this organization. You know, they do receive also some state funding. I was so that's say, become, it's connected to funding as right, well. That's you become know, an issue, yeah. whether they've, whether they really should be classified as a religious institution uh, or an institution of higher ed uh, that has a relationship to the public system. Hi, thank you. I have two questions. The first is, Linda, sorry, um, you mentioned that part of what you were doing is making opportunities for people to get involved. So my first question is, how can those of us who care about this get involved? Um, my second question is, you were mentioning how this is affecting authors. Um, I own a children's publishing company, and I'm curious if there's a ripple effect, if publishing companies are looking dissuaded from right, you know, from taking certain authors or allowing authors to write certain things because they're not going to potentially sell. Um, you want to take the second yeah, one? Sure. I'll take the first. I mean, that's a, it's a real issue. I mean, there's just a big 
controversy that blew up at Scholastic where they asked an author to take the word racist out of her, uh, like an author statement at the beginning of her book because they felt it was going to compromise their ability to sell the book in Florida and elsewhere. And she, you know, blew the whistle and went very public and they retracted it. But I think there's no question that publishers are on edge. I think that's why Penguin Random House got involved in our lawsuit. I think there's a lot going on with the textbook publishers. You alluded to that in your introduction, Linda, that we don't really know about, the uh, changes they're making. There was that uh, very public dispute about the AP African American Studies curriculum in Florida, where it seemed pretty clear that the college board altered that curriculum in response to the feedback that they got from the state of Florida. They denied it, but the timing and the nature of the changes they made, uh, suge you know, suggested, and it's like, it's only natural. I mean, Florida and Texas, they're big states. They set the pace for the rest of the country. If they're not gonna buy your textbook, you know, you may be in trouble, and so, it's very, it's a very worrying yeah. phenomenon, and and you know it's insidious. Also, it's editors who may not even realize they're rejecting a book because in the back of their mind is the voice of a censor in Florida, but they just say, well, maybe this is not the time, or you know, there's almost an instinct, a self-protective instinct yeah. that kicks in. And the publishing industry, as you know, um, isn't in the best of times right now. So uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, exactly. Risk averse. Good way to put it. Um, and in terms of, you know, what you can do to get involved, you know, I, I've uh, talked about this before in terms of, you know, not, not everybody runs a library and can start an initiative like this, but in some shape or form, everybody has an avenue, whether it's talking to elected officials or through whatever channels you're involved in, whether it's um, through your you know, children's schools or um, through your, you know, whatever community groups, the, you know, I, I just would, what I really am saying, I think in the, in the broadest way is it's important to be civically engaged. It, it's important to be active in your community, especially when there are threats like this that are occurring. And you can always become a supporter of PEN and America. America. <laughs> uh, go to our website at PEN.org, uh, and we would welcome you uh, getting involved in uh, our work. Uh, uh, here well in done. The blue, in the, uh, oh, okay. I'll come to you next. Thank you. Thank you. This has been fascinating. I was just thinking that we need to go beyond just the ability to get a book, but to teach it. And the example I couldn't help but think about, I remember when Lolita came out, and I did read it with a brown paper cover over it, and <laughs> what I got out of it, of course, was the sex scenes. And just a few years ago, I read reading uh, Lolita in Tehran, I think, yeah. is that the name of it? Azar uh, Nafisi's yeah. book, yeah. And I, I, you get so much more. It was about the role of women. I mean, the, this brilliant um, professor uh, held courses for, for girls in a very young women in a very dangerous situation if she was caught and I got so much more out of that book than I did when I read it with the brown cover how important our professors our teachers our elementary school is and I just want to go even further than as much as I love the QR code and I think that's great we need to go even further and say yes teachers are allowed to teach it and the, Absolutely, no disagreement on, from either of us on that point. The only other thing I'm going to say, it's beyond um, books, but my, my savior was putting my kids in front of Sesame Street and watching Bird and Ernie, and nobody ever thought of them as being gay. They're two puppets, <laughs> and now they can't watch Bird and Ernie anymore? I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think one of the startling things about this is is... Look, if you think about where young people are getting their information and what the corrupting influences in their lives are, it's not books, you know? <laughs> I mean, I have kids, uh, I'm sure many of you too, uh, do as well. You know, they spend hours upon hours on their phones. They have much, much more privacy than we ever had. You don't have to put a, a brown bag around your phone. You know, you just have a screensaver and you just look at it privately and no one knows uh, you know what you may be viewing and I think part of this 
backlash against books is that it's sort of that which adults can control. But there's so much of young people's lives that are really beyond our control and uh, out of our reach. And so there's this propensity to sort of clamp down um, on that what which you can, you can control. Yeah, I do think that's a big part of what's going on, actually. Please. Well, is, can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, let's see, I have a comment and some advice, and then a question about a specific book. I've lived on the next block since I moved here in 1975 to go to graduate school at Pratt, and hadn't been in the main branch of the Brooklyn Library since then. So my, my news is you don't have to live in Brooklyn to have a Brooklyn library card. I went in last year and walked out <laughs> with okay? a library. Well, it's good because I like to listen to audio books. Yes. And if I can't get the one yeah. on New York Public Library, yeah. I can hedge my bets. Yeah. So that's my advice. <laughs> now, does that create a big flood? And, and yeah, it... I mean, it's not great for us because we're spending money for people who live in Brooklyn. Um, and we worry about that. We're actually uh, very much... Um, She's going to have to report you. Yeah, no, oh, no, 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 no. I'll okay. tell you, it, it actually all sort of came tumbling down on me one day when I was at my uncle's funeral and my cousin who lives in rural Vermont was telling me how she's got one kid in Chicago and one in Washington. She has each of them registered for library cards in their, you know, libraries and she's using, uh, you know, the uh, the number in order to get books in Vermont. And I was just like, and this was years ago, I was just like, oh my God. Um, I do it all on my yeah, own. Yeah, oh exactly. God. But uh, the point is we work closely with New York Public Library and Queens uh, and we're very conscious of what policy changes within each institution will affect the other two. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it is an issue just because, um, although it may be counterintuitive, uh, digital material is much more expensive for us to buy than hard copy. And it, it goes back to uh, it goes back to copyright laws. You would think that it so would be a lot I less expensive. So when I an audio book, that costs you money? Oh, yes. Oh, it do oh I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, le I'll, I'll leave it to you in my will. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> please, please. Now, I grew up on a farm south of Kansas City. And in 1960s, I was 15. Somehow in this tiny school in the middle of nowhere, we read Catcher in the Rye. And it changed my life. I thought, what's going on out there? It started a love affair with Salinger. Is that book banned? Like yes, Catcher that's the... one of the books that shows up frequently. That makes me want to cry. Yeah. yeah. Here, you can pass the mic to uh, this lady. Um, I'm going back to uh, what you had said about involvement. And I mean, obviously, there are very many levels uh, and uh, around involvement. But there are a group of us in just, we happen to be in New York City because we know one another, uh, who are all academics. And uh, some of us have, not me, but others of us have headed the American Historical Society or the MLA, or, et cetera. We would like to be involved. And one of the things, was, we were thinking of several things, but one was around book banning. And with something like, we were, one of our thoughts, not mine, but my neighbor here, uh, was to um, pick maybe 10 banned books, try to get some interesting people to write something about them, and then put it on video and make it available online to whoever wanted to look yeah. at it. Would the, something like that be helpful yeah, or the, not? Yeah, I mean, there are, people are doing all kinds of great things with books that are banned. My only concern is that, you know, just because a book was banned doesn't mean that that's the book that you should be reading at the moment. You know, it's, um, it's, no, no, I, I understand. It's it's taking on sort of a life of its own. Um, but I, there are all kinds of programs and, um, you know, I'm happy to give you my contact information. That would be very um, sure. helpful to us. Thank you. OK, lots of questions. Uh, let's do these two here, uh, and then we'll come to this, the two sides. Hi. <clears throat> I am not as familiar with the funding and the structure of the different New York libraries. I contributed to the New York Public Library, but frankly, I didn't realize that contribution is separate from does not impact the other New York City libraries. Can you explain the structure a little bit more sure. in your funding and how you all work together and where you differ? Yeah, thanks. I, I probably should have started by explaining this. And, and I don't know what Pen America is. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll, well, we'll I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> so um, 
Uh, I have a, a trustee here in the audience. I'm, I'm smiling at her because this is a question we get all the time. So um, New York Public Library covers the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Um, and they have about 90 branches. Um, Queens is its own library system, and Brooklyn is its own library system. And partly because when um, because Brooklyn wasn't part of New York City when the library was founded. Um, we are each separate um, nonprofits, 501c3s, but we are funded 85% from the city of Philadelphia, and we get some state money. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, somebody that's should a, tell the people that's a, in Philadelphia that that's, that's a, that, going on. Yeah, because they're not getting so <laughs> much funding there. Be, yeah. Exactly. Um, I'm sorry. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're funded 85% from the city of New York. And we get some state money as well. Um, and we, have, uh, we are a single line item in the city's budget. And we're going through a, quite a contentious budget negotiation right now. But what we do is we, 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 we lobby as a block and then we have a formula that we use to divide the spoils when it's all said and done. Um, and we're really, you know, we're really not competitors except for that little loophole that you mentioned. Um, we're, we're basically serving different communities um, and we work very closely with each other. That's great. And just on PEN America, we're a nonprofit 501c3 with a mission to both celebrate and defend freedom of expression worldwide. So. We work on issues like book banning, but also disinformation, uh, the crisis in local news, press freedom issues here in the United States. And we do a lot of work around the world. Uh, heart and soul of it is on behalf of writers who are targeted for expressing themselves, who are persecuted or imprisoned in places like Iran, Turkey, Russia, uh, China. And then we have a whole literary celebration side of the organization where we do a big festival that happened uh, here in New York a few weeks ago, the Penn World Voices Festival. We do a lot of public programs. We do programs to enable uh, people to explore uh, and develop literary careers who would otherwise be excluded. So we have a big program for incarcerated individuals who want to write, where we mentor them and we help them uh, find a path to publication. And it's all on our website at pen.org. And I encourage you to take a look. There are ways to get involved. You could become a member of Pen, a supporter of Pen. We do a lot of literary events and dinners here in the city and would welcome you uh, to participate. So I think we had a, a question over here. Hi, my name is Griselle Acosta. I teach in the CUNY system. Um, I'm a professor, I'm a writer, and I want to say that this has been a wonderful event. Um, I do also want to talk a little bit about how, where a lot of these books are being banned are majority Latino spaces. Um, this, uh, at least in my lifetime, um, when it really was starting was during the Bush administration in Arizona, um, where they had ethnic studies and they were banning these ethnic studies and they did not call them book bans. They said that they were boxing the books. Um, they boxed the books and put them in a basement. Um, but basically what they learned in Arizona is that when you teach not only Latino students, but African-American students and white students, a diverse array of books, lo and behold, they graduate at higher rates. And they were going from 60% graduation rates in high school to 95% graduation rates. So they decided to ban this wonderful program. Um, so this does not surprise me. It surprises me when other folks are surprised that this is happening in our country. I lived in Texas for five years when I was earning my PhD, and none of my students there knew about the Latino authors that took me years to find. I did not find them until I was in college. So um, I feel like folks do not understand that uh, Latino, books have regularly been erased. Um, it is not just the house on Mango Street. There are so many Latino authors, and at this very moment, there are more Latino authors being published than ever. So it actually makes a lot of sense to me that this is when folks are deciding to ban 
more Latino authors and African-American authors and Asian authors than ever because we're all finding solidarity with each other. Um, so I say all of this because New York City is a Latino space as well. We are 20% of the population in the, in the US and more so in the Bronx, in Brooklyn. Um, I would like to know what we are doing, not only to keep Latino books from being banned, but to elevate the voices of Latino authors. We have been regularly erased. I was in my 20s when I first started reading a good chunk of Latino authors, and I don't want that to happen to any other young people. So that's my, that's what I'm bringing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, I, I you know, we're, we are not segmented, segmenting books by, um, by writers or by, you know, the origin of the writers. Um, it's more about the material in particular, but um, it's something to be mindful of. I want to say that um, I mentioned earlier that Nick Higgins and Summer Baumier are here, who are two um, important members of the Books on Band team. And if anybody has questions for them, I'm sure they'd be um, happy to speak as well. Yeah, just, I guess, you know, briefly from Pen America's part, I agree with you that it's no, it's no coincidence that finally you have these books kind of breaking through and getting assigned in classrooms and authors, new authors being discovered and becoming popular and really gaining traction and then you have this vociferous backlash. And you know, it's something for PEN America that is very important and very much a part of our organization. We have a program called the Emerging Voices Fellowship that's about people who are locked out of literary careers that just doesn't come from the background, the educational background, uh, the socioeconomic background to enable them to get a start. And we sort of give them a, a, jump, a jump start with mentoring and a range of other assistance. But there's, there's we did a big report uh, just a couple of months ago on the lack of diversity in publishing. Publishing uh, remains overwhelmingly white. I mean, the numbers are beginning to change, but it's against the backdrop of an industry that even in comparison to sort of law and accounting and other uh, professional sectors has been sort of notoriously slow in diversifying. So the issues that you raise are very real. Is that it? Yeah. Um, yes. oh. oh, sorry. OK, not OK. Oh, um, just... Yeah, go ahead. Um, I got, oh, what do I have to do, close, okay. Yeah. This is a bit positive. I did get an email saying that Governor Pritzker of Chicago is about to sign a bill that will defund money from any public library uh, that does not support unbanning. And to me, that was really important. Yeah. Please, yeah, applaud. We, we, yeah, yeah, no, we like that bill, yes. <laughs> absolutely. And also, I was disappointed, quite honestly, as an, a New Yorker, that it didn't happen here first. And it hasn't happened there yet officially, but it was something really positive, you know, um, and we need to get something positive. It's not fair that people who do the wrong things get all this publicity, and you know who I mean. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, I got a list of things that Mr. DeSatan does a lot. Mr. DeSatan. Oh, no, that's not his name. You're right. <laughs> Um, before, I, before I close the program, it's very hard to close this program. There's so much to be said. Um, may I just ask Nick and Summer to stand up so we can give you a little bit of recognition for the work that you've been doing. And um, Linda promised me she would tell you, but I'm going to tell you if she doesn't, that in June, Nick and Linda are going to Washington to receive the Freedom Forum Award, which is? Oh, yeah, I can't talk about it. Uh, okay. Which is really great. Yeah. All right. Really? I've actually, I was at that event last year. It's a really wonderful event and a very prestigious award. So congratulations. Um, so... Let me, let's thank our speakers for a marvelous program. And, um, 
everybody who feels like there's something they want to do, please contact the, your library, contact Penn. Um, Aspen has a program called Aspen Words where we recognize up and coming writers in um, Latinos, in black communities, and we give them a stipend to continue their work for the year. So there are good things happening out there, but please help us and participate. And thank you for coming. Thank you.